Now, let's start our conversation on today's topic, crisis and conflict, early warning from big data to AI, new analytical tools. As I mentioned, we have two experts with us, Professor Y. Z. Guo. He's an expert in data science, communication systems, and machine learning. He specializes in how AI and information systems can be designed for specific challenging environments or tasks. One focus lies on how to use AI to forecast war and peace situations. He'll give us a presentation on some of his work in a little bit. And then um, second, we have Dr. Paula Hidalgo Sanchez. She's an innovations advisor at UN Global Pulse, promoting the use of big data and artificial intelligence for social good and human development. She was head of the Kampala office in Uganda for several years and has managed many projects exploring the potential of new technology in critical environments. So, YZ, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Um, if um, Janet can bring up the slides, that would be really helpful. Right. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, I have not worked in conflict or political and social sciences for any more than two years. So I'm very much an outsider coming into this and hoping in a very genuine way that I can contribute and map some of my expertise um, to the fantastic contextualized work and domain specific work that has happened for decades, if not over a century. Um, but I think um, our chair touched on something very important, which is that do we have new technologies, new algorithms that can really help us? And the answer is actually no. <laughs> but what we have is new capability that make these algorithms run in real time that can really help you. That, that's the honest truth. So what's really enabled this? Uh, what, why couldn't we have done AI 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, right? And the answer is, A, in the context of conflict, we didn't have the data. We, you know, um, if you look in historical times, medieval times, you get famous 300 battles, right, and these kind of things. And they're all historical records with poor accuracy, often written by the victory party. And what we have now in the last 20 years, I would say, is geotag data across different databases. You know, you're looking at ACLED, UCDP, PRIO, um, Global Terrorism Database, and you know it, right? You know it better than me. And these databases, although still developing and expanding their remit, is just simply fantastic and is way better than what we had 20, 30 years ago, right? So that gives you the power to at least start to train some models at high fidelity to achieve prediction that might be meaningful, right? But of course, that has issues with rural areas, et cetera, that we will come on to in, an, in a minute. The second aspect is high-performance computing at cheap and online scales. And this is really important. Previously, you know, high-performance computing was reserved for government and serious scientific enterprises um, at a tremendous cost, and you had to drive to secure facilities to use them. But today, you know, you can just buy a few credits on Microsoft or Azure or, you know, Amazon, and you can use that. And it will probably be doing the equivalent of a national high-performance computing enterprise 10 years ago. So that's amazing, you know, available at a fingertip. And more so is this demand for prediction. And we touched on this in our breakout group very rapidly is where, where is this demand coming from? Now, I want to talk about that later. But there is a demand for AI to supplement and complement human expertise simply because we don't have enough human experts. And I'll go back to that in a minute. But what is AI? Well, AI is nothing other than standard statistical models and mechanical models that tries to say something contextual in a mathematical or numerical way. But what deep learning achieves, and I'll show you that in a minute, is the automated discovery of knowledge. So no longer is a human saying, I'm defining features. I'm defining how features come together. What deep learning is doing is 
telling you how the machine sees the data and how these features might come together at very high dimension, at very high dimensions, uh, far beyond your wildest imagination. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. This is a demonstration of the things that AI do great in and the things that AI do really badly in. So this is a Gaussian process. For those who are familiar with AI, you know how Gaussian processes and deep Gaussian processes work. And it's a time series predictor um, using kernels. And what it's doing is looking at historical values of conflict to predict future ones. And here we have a white swan events on the left. White swan events are regressive events. And I'll give you contextualized example. For example, in Baghdad, you have cycles of revenge attacks where one bomb leads to, a, a, you know, revenge bombing, etc. You have periodic bombings on Easter Sundays, for example, at major religious festivals. So you have both long-term trends and short-term dynamics, all that can be discovered by the AI model to make reasonably good predictions. And that's fantastic, but it's not really telling you things that you don't really know. It might be useful, but it's not giving you extra knowledge. Towards the right-hand side, you have black swan events, which are very difficult to predict, but w should you be able to do that, you'll be able to gain extra insight, I believe. So here is um, um, a massacre on um, rural Nigeria border in the north near Medagudri, and um, this is a UN outpost that's being overrun, and then the, the neighboring villages were attacked um, over a period of time, and as you can see, you have very little violence, building up to it, you may see tension, you may see skirmishes, but you have very little precursor, at least in the data domain, um, to, to predict the sudden um, you know, explosion in violence. So this is interesting, and this is um, a black swan event. Um, okay, so here what you see is that AI performs very well in data-rich scenarios, in auto-regressive scenarios, and often, um, if we look to Africa and places that have been in co conflict continuously over the last um, couple of decades, AI does very well in these kind of places. But you, you go to other places where you have never had conflict for several, several years, or even over a decade, and then there's an emerging crisis. That's very hard to predict just using raw data itself. So you must develop intuition. You must leverage on your um, domain expertise to build customized models that can do that. For example, to have an event that triggers the AI into action, right? So in our um, commentary piece at Nature called Retool AI, the key is the word retool. It's not about AI. People immediately reacted to the word AI and war and peace. But the key is to retool AI in a way that's contextualized towards the domain expertise to pick out these black swan events. That was a driving message. Um, next slide, please. So what are we doing in the UK? And many people here have commented on the German government's um, um, efforts to, to fund large programs in prediction. Uh, the UK is also funding um, programs through me um, and through the Alan Turing Institute called GARD, which is Global Urban Analytics for Resilient Defense. What we're building is a recognition that there are so many different domains and often, unfortunately, siloed domains that address conflict from the geopolitical to the socioeconomic to the ethno-linguistics and many others, I'm sure. What we want to do is to quantify these domains into general models and link them together via these coupled interaction network models. And what we're trying to do is create a conflict engine that before any artificial intelligence describes mathematically what we think, how these mecha mechani mechanisms work, and then start putting the artificial intelligence on top of it to fit it to data, to fit it to historical data. And that now includes climate change factors because the UK is very much interested in how long-term climate change and population migration fundamentally changes the uh, social fabric of, of our civilizations. Um, in a topological and other 
mechanisms. So, so what we have is this multi-layered model uh, collapsed onto the right. So on the right, you see the world map. Um, this is a multi-layered model collapsed into two-dimensional visualization. Uh, what you see are almost 10,000 cities and towns, how they connect together through trade, through political affiliation. So we can see how changes on the political or on the economic layer cascade down to the geopolitical and conflict layers, even both within a certain region, but also across the world. And what we see intuitively, perhaps, and uh, I was told that this is really helpful, is that the blue aspects, the blue links, are evidence of friendly relations. So either through military exchange or economic, significant economic trade or um, political um, alliances. But the green aspects, which is much harder to quantify, is a complete absence of any of those. And it's really interesting to see some green, as the mouse was going through the Andes Mountains, which is a natural geographic barrier, of course. But then there are other aspects of green you can see between Western and Eastern Europe, which shocked me, at least, because I didn't realize there was still a lack of interaction um, you know, between Western and Eastern Europe, also between Norway and Sweden, but the Scandinavians can tell you more about that, <laughs> um, probably historical. And for example, that shield of green around Nigeria, showing that there's a lack of regional security and trust around Nigeria. And all of these are indicative topological features across multiple domains and scales that indicate something about conflict. And what we're doing now is integrating the dynamics of climate change with the UK Met Office and official climate predictions. So on the bottom, you will see the temperature predictions, the sea level predictions, and using that to see how population might migrate because migration changes the fundamental structure of our world in terms of population and the stability of our world in many, many of these domains. Um, that's my message. This is useful to so many people from protection of aid workers to um, informing diplomacy. Quite how it can be used, of course, is a political and a much more nuanced uh, discussion. But the tool and the demand for this kind of tool is definitely out there. That's my pitch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, YZ. Let me ask you one question. Is there a case where the kind of work you do and the data that you've analyzed has actually given you information on a conflict that wasn't on the agenda before? Can you, can you tell us a little about hmm. that? Absolutely. So we started this work over three or four years ago. And um, one of the things we picked out early on was um, Western Myanmar. Back then, I don't think it was an issue, at least not, not on the global kind of... Um, um, thinking, but but back then we, we felt it was going to be a crisis sooner or later. Um, we also identified South and Saudi Arabia and Yemen as a big problem back about four or five years ago when we first built a very basic version of this model. Um, and um, back then we couldn't really explain it and we didn't really have the expertise to kind of explain it. And um, But our predictions have generally been pretty good and we, we were able to predict many things um, which we don't fully understand, to be honest, which is one of the challenges, such as um, a new peace coming out of Colombia. That was another thing. Um, so it's not just about war. It's also about emerging peace from, you know, sustained warfare. Thank you very much. We'll go more into this in the conversation after Paula's presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you again for the for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Let me say some words uh, before I start presenting some practical cases on how in global posts we've been doing AI to support uh, uh, conflict and, and peace and security processes. So UN Global Pulse is the UN Secretary General's initiative on big data, artificial intelligence for development, humanitarian action and peace. Our vision is a future in which big data, artificial intelligence, and emerging technologies are harnessed safety, safely and responsibly for the public good. So while we have been conducting experimental work um, with new emerging technologies, we can move to the next slide already. UN Global Pulse has been leading the efforts in the UN system to develop data privacy protection and ethics principles to work with big data, artificial intelligence, and new frontier technologies. 
We engage on a regular basis and through set and forums with privacy specialists and regulators from governments, from private sector and from academia to contribute to policy frameworks for the use of, uh, of big data and AI. We also are working with governments to facilitate uh, synergies and knowledge exchange uh, to create um, uh, policy frameworks and legal frameworks for all these things. I always uh, I used to talk about data privacy and protection and digital ethics at the end of my presentations. Now I choose to do it at the beginning so that uh, the public uh, understand and the participants understand that every example I'm going to present, we're always considering these data privacy and protection principles and ethical guidelines while doing them, implementing them, and also while disseminating results. We can move to the next slide now, please. So one of the frontier directions of work of Global Pulse is uh, peace and security. We've done here uh, some experimental work for many years now. Uh, and I emphasize experimental because I think that for, for new things, as my personal experience, for new things, and especially for this uh, topic that we are uh, discussing today, we need to do a lot of experimentation. I think we can uh, get more results and design better tools if we start from the experimentation rather than from a framework already established and trying to fit that already established framework into new technologies. I think experimenting works better. So we've been working in this area for some time. What you see here in this slide is just an example of some work we did with social media analysis in Somalia. So it was just about understanding different opinions, pro and contra, uh, contra, in this case, Amazon and al -Sabab. So it's just a, a, an example of something that I'm sure you already know very well, that is social media mining of public Facebook groups. We can move now to the next slide, and I'm going to start with my first example. I have three examples to, to, to present you. The first example is the work we've been doing with digital hate speech monitoring. We have been working for several years now on exploring the correlations of online and offline violence. Uh, and we saw, as Dr. Washi was uh, uh, just mentioning, in Myanmar, we saw this correlation. The whole world, I think, witnessed the correlation of hate speech online uh, in social media against the Rohingya, Rohingya people, sorry, and a correlation with offline violence. What do I understand for hate speech? I have just copied here in this slide uh, from the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech, what we understand for hate speech. But let me just read it out loud for you. Hate speech is in itself an attack of toler on tolerance, inclusion, diversity, and the very essence of our human rights, norms, and principles. More broadly, it undermines social cohesion, erodes shared values, and can lay the foundation for violence, setting back the cause of peace, stability, sustainable development, and the fulfillment of human rights for all. In the current uh, context of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, we have witnessed uh, uh, an increase of hate speech against uh, different groups. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appealed on May 2020 to end hate speech globally mentioning the anti-foreign sentiment, anti-semitic conspiracy theories and COVID-related anti-Muslim attacks. So we, we uh, see now that in the context of the current pandemic, it is speech is also increasing. The team at Global Pulse have done, uh, as I was saying, different uh, type of analysis over time. Just to mention two of them, we did this analysis for two years, 2015 and 16, about hate speech and perception of hosting populations in Europe around uh, migrants' communities in Europe. Another example of the work we did was social media monitoring on discrimination uh, on, on HIV AIDS uh, in Brazil. This was done with Ministry of Health and, and UNAIDS. We move to the second uh, example, the next slide, please. So from hate speech to my second example, the work we, are, we have been conducting for several years and we are uh, now conducting a new country 
on improving situation awareness with radio mining. What is radio mining? Uh, what I showed you before on the example in Somalia is just some glimpse of the uh, of what is called uh, data mining on social media. We can do the same with public discussions on radio. Why radio? Because radio is the as a social media platform. It is used as a social media platform in many countries in Africa and in other regions in the world, and it's really large the volume of the amount of people that uses radio for for sharing reports about what happens in local communities, for sharing opinions, expressing concerns, etc. Only in Uganda, uh, we estimated, Global Post estimated, that around 2,500 2, people speaks on a daily basis on radio talk shows in Uganda. As I would say, mainly in rural areas, and as I was saying, mainly about issues affecting their communities. So Global Pulse developed this, uh, this tool based on artificial intelligence that is extracting from uh, real, in real time insights from radio, public radio broadcast, doing analysis uh, uh, and in 24 hours the data is available in the dashboard. Just an example on how is this useful for the topic area that we are discussing today. We apply this technology in Uganda when the influx of refugees started from the from South Sudan in July 2016. This world war this was work commissioned by the UN country team to Global Pulse. And um, basically what happened at that time is that from one day to another there were thousands of people from South Sudan refugees uh, going into neighboring countries, especially Uganda. So thousands of people on a daily basis were crossing the, the border. So we use this tool to analyze what people were saying on the radio about this. What was the hosting community saying about this? Was there resentment about the refugees? Was there, uh, were there issues affecting social cohesion, etc.? So we applied uh, this technology and we did an analysis of the first month since the influx of refugees and then six months later, and we appreciated the changes in the opinions of those speaking on the radio, not of the total population of Uganda, but those speaking in the radio on the radio in Uganda at that time. I move now to uh, my third example, uh, work that we've been doing to improve risk detention and early reaction. Global Pulse, uh, we have established a partnership with the company DataMirn, and through this company, uh, through this uh, partnership, the product first alert is now available to the UN system. As of today, uh, there is an estimation that 2,800 users in 40 UN agencies are using this product, First Alert. And what is First Alert? I invite you to go and check on the website. It would be much better explained that I can do it. But just briefly, basically, it's an AI-based tool and is just analyzing in real time any open source of information available for the topics that you as a user select. So I remember when I was testing this, uh, the product for, to test disability for the UN system, I worked in Afghanistan in the past, so I will put Afghanistan, specific areas of Afghanistan, and the uh, locations there, and the type of alerts I wanted to receive based on the different topics. And then on a daily basis for any type of open source, uh, not open source, sorry, open uh, data source in my social media or any other, then you receive alerts. So basically the benefit of this is the, the rapid uh, response. It allows for rapid response because normally, and you can see some examples of this in the, web, in the website of the, of the company, it's really, really fast. You get insights really, really fast, faster than, than reading the, the news, much faster than reading the news. So it, can, it has been used for natural disasters, hurricanes, cyclones, wildfire, earthquakes, but also for other type of conflicts. So I stop here with the three examples to let more time for questions and answers. That is always the most interesting part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, before we give you time to reflect, there are two questions in the chat concerning uh, technical aspects of your examples, and I would uh, like you to answer those before we go into the small groups and let me read them to you 
there's uh, the question, what tool or software do you use to data mine uh, social media like Facebook? What's the tool or software? Yeah, without going into, into details, by mandate and by choice in global polls, we do everything with open source uh, software. We always uh, recycle anything that is available and we build on it and then we make it public. The only obsession we have because of the nature of the work we are doing is with the radio mining uh, tool because of the data privacy and protection issues related to it and ethical issues. So you're so using different tools. We're using different tools and we're mm -hmm. always using open source and building on open source software. Okay, and there's a second question actually from Adriana, our speaker from last week. Hello, Adriana. Good to see you again. Uh, she asked, is it possible to use radio mining type technology to analyze trends in other media, including private company apps such as WhatsApp? Well, what the radio mining tool is doing is uh, analyzing uh, audio content. So we have developed transcription software for African vernacular languages. That's what the, it gets tricky and complicated. Uh, so we've done this already in three countries in Africa. So it's really about developing the tra transcription uh, software for local uh, African languages. But then the tool itself is very complex. It's not just one tool. It's, it's really a really complex thing because it's about the data stream, then it's about the transcription, then it's about the analysis part of it. So it's really a, a lot of, of different pieces. Mm -hmm. It can be applied for many things, but basically we design it and we still keep on building the, the design for audio. So it's basically more designed for audio content. Okay. Um, someone wants to know which local languages you've used this on, African languages. We have done this in Uganda for Luganda and Acholi and the way English is spoken in Uganda, that is different than the English. So if you would use the transcription software that is available to purchase it over the shelf for English, it won't work in, in Uganda. And then we've done this also, we've done work also in Somalia and we're doing some work also in Mali. Okay, thank you.